And to start, I'm just going to introduce the folks we have on the panel today. I'm going to let them do really most of the talking. And through talking to them, I've learned so much personally. So first off, we have Inji Lin, who is one of the co-owner at Gucci Dumpling. You probably have seen her around. You have been to the restaurant. And then next up is Miss Helena, who grew up in the military village, who's actually also my mother. <laughs> and next we have Tony, who's our head chef at Gucci Dumpling. She's the brain trust behind all, if you have been here on a Wednesday through Friday, or been on a original pattern brewing pop-up, that's a product, that's a brainchild. And finally, we have Henry, who is the mastermind today behind a very, very delicious new beef noodle soup we've all tasted. So let's uh, give him a round of applause. Well, so first off, I know the first thing I'm going to ask is, uh, Angie, I know there is a, <laughs> there's a particular thing you want to create when we talked about doing this event many months ago. Yeah, well, that, uh, and by the way, that we did not rehearse all this at all. Yeah. So that's what I look like. <laughs> yeah, so uh, because it's really that, uh, so, and by the way, since everyone coming today really, really appreciate this, that uh, so we have been doing Papa and annoying Henry for such a long time. <laughs> um, and uh, so, uh, so s since we were doing the papa, we love good food, good people, and uh, we also love that how food can bring people t together. And uh, the most importantly, that um, we introduce uh, special flavors, special dish to the com community, and we also love that the stories uh, behind the food. So one of our the most passionate thing about that. Uh, so when when we think uh, that we are finally going to get our uh, restaurant. Well, but the most important thing to us is that we really want to get more stories across and through the food. So, and, uh, so we started uh, making, uh, we started our business as selling and making dumplings. And actually in Taiwan, that, uh, so when I growing up that, uh, so in Taiwan there's a one kind of the specialty store that is always like, uh, like new rou mian sui jiao. So basically, uh, beef noodle soup and a dumpling. So that's one kind of the specialty store, and uh, you will find uh, like uh, in in some in some areas. And in recent years, it's all over the place. And why dumplings and the beef noodle soup always show up together? And the one there's the one kind of the. Uh, specialty store selling those and um, so we feel that yeah so we all love dumpling we all heard of, uh, about uh, beef noodle soup but we want to share these stories so um, so 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 this is why we are having this event here so uh, I will so sh great yeah so now that we just talked about the beef noodle soup and dumpling, how they are now everywhere, and beef noodle soup is known as a national dish. But Henry, as I understand, prior to the 1950s, before people fled China for Taiwan, people didn't eat beef noodle soup. That was not something you can find, right? But what, why is that? What happened? Um, can you get this word? Yeah. Um, do how many people here have had beef noodle soup before? And how many people know that it's specifically a Taiwanese thing? And we could talk about that definition later, um, get into that if we um, go that direction. But um, so Taiwanese beef noodle soup, it's considered to be the national dish of Taiwan. Um, but as Sean is mentioning, it's the it didn't originate until after 49, and there's a lot of geopolitical stuff going on, which I can do a really quick, would that benefit everyone if I talked a little bit about the culture, politics, history? So, and so Sean did say people fleeing from China to Taiwan in 1949, but in essence, people maybe have been fleeing for centuries to the island of Taiwan. Um, the island of Taiwan is, uh, part of Micronesia and um, has an indigenous population 
that now we say is 2% of the population of the uh, island. So 98% of the population is ethnically Chinese, but it had traditionally been um, directly across the strait in Fujian province and specifically southern Fujian province. So the dialect that I grew up speaking, my parents are actually half. Um, my mother's side is, we used to say, or we still say it, but we say Taiwanese, but actually it's just a very specific population. I think in Taiwan now, people are very PC and everyone says everyone here is Taiwanese, whatever ethnic group you are. But the predominant group of 70 something percent is directly from across the strait, which is considered southern China. And then 14% of the population is Hakka, traditionally, which is what my father's side is, um, and which has another whole uh, dietary and culinary history. Um, and anyway, so, um, and then in 1949, when the KMT, the um, the Kuomintang that was with under Chiang Kai-shek was fleeing mainland China from the communists. People came from every province of China, mostly military, political leaders. It's a small island, so not everyone could come. But we have representation from all provinces of uh, China in Taiwan. And beef noodle soup, okay, sorry, I'm nervous. Sorry. <laughs> uh, you, you got this, Henry. You got this. <laughs> um, and I talk a lot, so I'm like, where do I go with this? Um, so many factors. I mean, we could break it down to, as many people here know, in Taiwan and in Chinese culture, people are not eating beef or oxen. Uh, they were work animals. They were pets. There's a Buddhist history. There's not a lot of meat eating. Um, prior to uh, this era. And wheat also is from northern China. So the ethnic Chinese that were already on the island of Taiwan were predominantly eating rice or rice noodles or taro and other starches. And then, um, so, but the military that came from, there's some contention about in beef noodle soup if it's from two different areas of China, mainland China. But the kind of soup that you had here, the hong sao, the braised red Sichuan style, is um, kind of attributed to some of the military dependents who were living in these villages that were set up by the government. And, um, and some of that flavor profile is the Sichuan peppercorn and the spice, which we did not cook with in Taiwan. The ethnic Chinese were not cooking with before. The beef, actually, I always thought of it as a 1949 uh, allied with the U.S. and getting cheap beef imported from the U.S. during that time. But it turns out, and researching just for this event, um, I didn't realize that there was this Japanese component because Taiwan was also a part of Japan from 1898 till 1945. And it turns out the Japanese newly after the Edo period, because they were closed off to the rest of the world, when they opened up in the 20s and 30s, they also were not eating beef and other land animals. But then because of the um, connection to Europe and trying to westernize, they started making um, meat more important in the diet. And actually they started building meat packing plants and importing cows from Japan to Taiwan in the 30s. So. They say that it kind of primed the locals in Taiwan to start eating meat, but it was mostly the elite. But then not until uh, the US government and the importation of kind of cheap or cheaper or accessible beef and wheat products was this an available thing for the Sichuanese uh, community to start playing around with. And, putting out. So that's kind of the history of this soup and how it kind of developed. And so people will often refer to it as, oh, this is, and I know this is a political thing and very cultural, but um, when people start talking about, no, this is from Sichuan province, or this is from mainland China, like, no, people weren't eating beef there. So it turns out, um, and this is another interesting, last time I was in Taiwan, I was going to a lot of beef noodle soup shops, and I went to a few halal ones from 
the immigrants from Western China that were also known to be the first makers at restaurants for the public of beef related things. So that was kind of interesting. The, mus the Muslim population was kind of the first kind of cooking with beef in Taiwan. So that's the story. And I'll take a breather and explain uh -huh. this soup and uh, how this came to be. I've been working on this soup for 10 years casually, living here in the Bay Area and kind of the ingredients and how it came to be this way. But maybe I'll do that later. Yeah, we'll, we'll give it a little breather here. So as Henry was mentioning, the beef noodle soup is one of the many dishes that were brought over by the military folks, uh, the folks that ended up living in the military dependence village. Uh, actually, the next question I want to ask both uh, Chef Tony and Miss Helena, besides what we have here today, the beef noodle soup and the dumpling, what other food that you have seen that were brought over from China when people left and came, all came to stay in Taiwan? Yeah, I grew up in a village, military village, and my family is a more traditional. So I usually, we don't have uh, too many people come to my house, but I saw uh, my neighbors, they always kind of like, uh, you know, people, <clears throat> they exchange food uh, because we all come from different province. So then we have a different style of the food. So then, I feel that's a very interesting. And one of my neighbors, they made a, the leek uh, pasta. So then. Like a leek dumpling, like a bigger. Yeah. So they, they look kind of like a pan fried dumpling, but they're a lot bigger. And they usually have uh, like a rice noodles. Yeah, yeah. I think. It, People put the legs or some, depends on uh, what you like. Uh, maybe they will put a uh, dry toast and a, li a little bit of uh, ground meat. And like my neighbor, they always eat that. But we, my family, we, we make a noodle more. Um, so we never had that. So then we switch with that. So I think that's very interesting if you live in the military and so people can share different kind of food. And what, what province is your family originally from? Hunan. Hunan. Yeah. But you know, uh, we live in Taiwan. That's, sorry. Uh, <laughs> and we live in the village. So as I said before, people come from different different area and so we changed the taste my parents they didn't really eat the spicy that much I know supposedly Hunan they eat the more spicy but we didn't so that I came to United States and I found a, a diverse people uh, culture mix food mix it's just like the village okay the military village yeah the myth, the food. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think for me, the remember when I was a child, I really loved to go to buy the uh, the steam bao bang, we call mantou. Usually always the one very old grandpa will be make that every morning. And you can very far away can smell the mantou is ready. Then always I love with the um, fermented tofu, we call tofu roux. So I always open that, put into the tofu roux inside, and that's my breakfast with the um, uh, soy milk. This is my yeah. This is my favorite. When I grown up, I eat this a lot. Then for sure, um, beef noodle soup and the dumplings really everywhere. All the street, all the 
uh, your neighbor really have five, six is really popular. So for me, I really love the Henry style one because it's really spicy mm. and they can remind me when I was a child, I, I always go to eat the, the beef noodle soup. But in Taiwan, we have a lot. You can choose noodle or dumpling. So I always choose dumpling because I love I don't know, I love dumpling, so this is why I make a dumpling. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I love dumpling, the chewy, the dough, the chewy with the really good spicy soup together. So that's my favorite uh, when I grow up, eat the beef noodle soup. So this is my memory. So so for me, dumpling, noodle, and uh, mantou with the, some very, a lot of pickle, Taiwan, a lot, we call um, yan cai, just use the, some pickle, tofu, and just with the mantel, really simple flavor, but it's a lot. You can taste a lot of love. So this is how I eat the different food from the China. I need to say that, yeah. And oh, one other one other thing that this makes me think of is, because when, I mean, I grew up in the States, so going back to Taiwan for the last 50 years, it's kind of discovering food and kind of trying to figure out for whatever reason, like how did this come to be? What's Taiwanese? What's from China? What's from different provinces of China? Like what is actually unique? And um, and so speaking of all these things, because my favorite things to, some of my favorite things to eat when I go back to Taiwan are yes, all of these things that probably only existed since 1949. Because my, my mother and my aunt is here, my mom's sister is here. Um, but she'll always say to me, we didn't eat that growing up. We just had rice things. We didn't eat that. Those, those are all those wheat things like we weren't used to and whatever, all this stuff. But, um, but those are the kind of things I gravitate towards. And one of the things that I, besides beef noodle soup being, you know, everyone wants this. It's a part of the culture. I think there's every year there's national contests for beef noodle soup, who makes the best, and there's a variation of it. Um, but the other well-known thing from, I think, China that everyone thinks of as being very Taiwanese is the xiaolongbao, but the soup dumpling, but the ding tai feng version. So, and, but, and this is my little beef sometimes, because I'll, once I read in Bon Appetit magazine, they said, Oh, Taipei is so hip and it's so whatever and so international. They make xiaolongbao with exquisite thin skin, as thin as Shanghai. And I was like, no, Shanghai, it's a thick skin. It's this particular family from Shanghai that immigrated to Taiwan during that time. They are the ones that developed that thin skin that now has kind of become ubiquitous and kind of what everyone's kind of seeking. So little things like that always get me excited because <laughs> yes, it comes from here and there, but like when did it get kind of gelled in Taiwan? So anyway. So I, 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 uh, I really want to add, add, uh, add on that because um, so, well, I was born in 1979, so, uh, so uh, I'm like not really younger generation, uh, but another. So uh, I'm more like in between. So I remember clearly that when I grew up, so whenever we go to those beef noodle soup uh, restaurant, so we were told that, oh, these are authentic Sichuan style of the beef noodle soup. And we were like, oh, wow, so this is the Sichuan food. And, uh, and we went to some other restaurant. Oh, this is the authentic Hunan cuisine. Oh, okay. So, 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 and I never realized that all of this food are created by immigrants. And they are already away from their, from where they born and raised. And they also did not have the access to the exactly the same uh, ingredient and the sauce. So they create those food from here, from their heart. And so it's just, for me that, uh, so uh, after I graduated from college and start to, start to travel, start to learn more about the food around the world. And I all of a sudden realized, oh, it's not Sichuan beef noodle soup. So this is just people living in Taiwan. They call it Sichuan beef noodle soup. And it's actually invented 
from Taiwan. So there are a lot of stories like this. And, and this is what I found so fascinating about how immigrants create food using their memories and they, they use the same uh, sense of the taste and that they use their uh, knowledge but leveraging the local resources to remake the food they miss. And also because everyone is immigrant. So just like Miss Helena so, uh, just mentioned in military uh, village, everyone live together. So, 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 so when people being served that, oh, so this is the one kind of the dumpling from Dongbei, then, then from people's mind that it's really that there's no really a good judgment about authentic or not. There's, so it's only one like it's delicious or not. So, so good flavor or new dishes start to get created this way. And this is why I, so yeah, so after I grew up, I really that, I feel like almost every two to three years, I discover there's one dish actually invented by Taiwan. <laughs> that, uh, and where I grew up, I saw that uh, it's authentic from somewhere else. It's so interesting this way. Yeah, it's like we have this experiment when we bring people from really, really far away, I'll put them on a small island, live very, very close to each other, don't give them a lot of resources, and then Taiwan food, uh, Taiwanese food from that time was born. Henry, you were gonna. Oh, I was just gonna say, like, I think they say even in Taiwan, 95% of the beef is imported, so that's not even local. Yeah. But even though local beef noodle soup shops will talk about Huang Miao and they'll say, oh, this is a local one, this is a local Taiwanese one. But then some people will say, oh no, the American one, the corn fat, it's fatty, it tastes better. So anyway, but so it's all imported ingredients and um, so, Oh, but I guess, should I talk about this? I guess I can talk a little bit about this. I wanted to call out this soup for me. It, you know, reminds me of Taiwan and it's something that I seek out when I go there. And here, um, just I really wanted to make something that I thought was good. And, um, but I, I, so I, my, I have a day job, which is, I work for a tofu company uh, here in Oakland. And I, it was my first food job. I came back to the Bay Area and started working on food. And then I started working at this tofu company. I did food tours on the weekends, and then I was doing dumpling classes and one Taiwanese pop-up a year um, for, and this is the first time I've done anything in three years, I think, um, in this kind of public manner. And, um, but I, because of the food tours and because of all the research I've done in food and all the people that I've met, um, I'm very ingredient focused, if anyone here, I mean, you're all Bay Area food people, so you're probably all pretty um, <laughs> ingredients focused, but um, I just wanted to let you know, the beef uh, is 100% pasture-raised, organic, local, regenerative farm beef, and uh, it's the beef shank is hard to find cut in a certain way, and then also the, the bones. And when I was in Taiwan and I was explaining to uh, my aunt, who is a vegetarian, Anyway, um, how, what I was doing, well, she cooks meat things for everyone else, but she um, is a vegetarian herself. Um, but she was saying, oh no, you make bone broth for 48 hours? No, all the heavy metals come out. You can't do that. And I go, oh no, it's organic, it's pasteurized. And she's like, that's fine. So the tendon, I think Sean explained to a few people, I was like, I can find clean, quote unquote, clean bones and I can find clean beef, but I cannot find clean tendon anywhere because most of the pasture raised beef in this Bay Area that we live in um, is dry aged and they hang the, the leg from the Achilles tendon. So it's just hard to find. So we had to find it from two different sources to have enough for today and to kind of like scooch around the Bay Area to find it. So I hope everyone ate their tendon and enjoyed it. And then, um, and I used several tomatoes, but I, uh, I don't know if they're here at this lunch or they're coming later, but we all kind of met through also a Taiwanese farmer up in Sonoma County, Radical Family Farms. 
So I used some tomatoes from them, and then I used some others from Lucero Farms. And um, so just try to be, um, pay attention to ingredients in California, eyes it somewhat. <laughs> but the dou ban chang, which is the broad bean paste, the classic Sichuanese one, I use the, I think we all use the same one from Taiwan, uh, from a family that, uh, that immigrated to Kaohsiung from, um, from Sichuan province. But it's everywhere, you can find it. And if you want to know what it is, you can ask us later. But, um, but you can find it everywhere. But it's really good. Even in Taiwan, that's what everybody uses. Um, so. Yeah, I think in some way I appreciate the thought Henry put into finding the ingredient. Because I think it's similar to how people lived in Taiwan. We really eat off the land, whatever the land provides, we eat. So if it means these are the beef that we have, it makes sense that we, you know, we source them for today. Uh, but there's one thing that, that Henry mentioned earlier I want to circle back to. I'm going to have a question for you, Miss Helena, mom. Uh, Henry mentioned that a lot of the wheat was really brought over by U.S. when they were providing aid after the war. And really a lot of the farm was growing rice, not wheat. And really without the wheat from U.S., we probably would be pretty difficult for people to make all the noodles and all the dumplings. So. Um, Mom, I remember you tell me about some memories about kind of getting food through the U.S. aid and being in a military village. So maybe you can tell, share with everyone how that experience was like. Okay. Uh, being a military, you don't get a good pay. And plus, at that time, uh, most of the family has more kids. Okay. So, sorry. Uh, Jiang, uh, oh, the food. Yeah. So, we, we kind of like we were short of the food. Okay. And then later on, I think when I was maybe 12, and United States sent some food, like uh, the flour, uh, uh, like a... Uh, Is it they also provide butter? Yeah, the bottle. The bottle is in a, like a, the can, actually is in the can. Okay, and some like a cracker. I think that's for military. Uh, so we, we eat, we eat that. And that time we, we kind of like, we appreciate it. At least we have something. And then later on, uh, Later on, the government like uh, will say based on the children's age, like uh, how age you get uh, how much uh, the rice or the flour or the salt. I remember. Like they give you a ticket. Yeah. Then you can go redeem the ticket for a certain amount of flour. Right. And a certain amount of salt. Yeah. Actually, Xiang, when he was little, he didn't know. Okay. So, uh, no, no, because that time it's already uh, changed the system, so he didn't know. So I shared with him just recently, one of my neighbor, and you know sometimes the Taiwanese people, uh, they don't live in the, mili uh, the military village, and they plan, maybe they plan something, they plan the, uh, the vegetable, or some, like a yen, and but I don't know that time why they had a hard time to buy salt. So they will come, they will carry them into the village and they share. No, they switch with us. We gave them salt and then they gave us uh, whatever we kind of like a trade. Yeah. Right, mom, I remember also telling me in the village, because everything was so packed, people didn't have room to grow any vegetables for themselves. So sometimes through the aid they have extra salt they can trade with the, the Taiwanese who are already there before who have farm who maybe have different vegetables. And and that happened, that's kind of one of the things the village ha had to get things besides the basic, the, the flour, the salt, and oil. You know, I think that's how people will do. Uh, <clears throat> if you need some vegetable, or you need some other food, I think you will try eat less salt in order to switch some food 
to me your full. Yeah, that's So one other thing I want to talk about is uh, that Inji mentioned how uh, for the experience of the Taiwanese military. For us, it's really uh, what are the tasting profile that we feel unique from Taiwan. And also some cooking method that how Taiwanese use uh, fermentation, pickling prop process and uh, incorporate those ingredients into uh, the daily meal. Uh, and also, is there any special sauce that uh, being crafted so beautifully uh, uh, in Taiwan that we want to represent those flavors too. So, um, and uh, and uh, to be honest, for us, that uh, we keep asking ourselves th this question too, that uh, because uh, I feel uh, now we live here, and uh, for us, that one of the most important philosophy that uh, when we talk about Taiwanese uh, cuisine is also to incorporate fresh local ingredient because Taiwan is a small island that uh, we always uh, able to access something from the land, something from the sea, and uh, all kinds of the fresh local ingredient. Uh, so how do we incorporate exactly the same idea that but uh, recreate the dish that uh, we we deeply love and remember is a key for us too. So 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 that's why you have been seeing that we why we keep creating, keep partnering with local food maker, with local ingredients that's part of our effort on this. Okay. I think um, for me, uh, because I came from America just like uh, six years before ago, so I just really uh, met my home meet my family make meat for me, including I go to street and eat the beef noodle soup, dumpling, everything. All the flavor I just really mix it. So I start to find where I can find the home flavor. So it's really, really hard can find here. So I start to making. Then so a lot of people eat my food will be filled. First comes, oh really like a home make. Yes, for sure, because of all the cuisine, I know the knowledge is all from my family, all from my grandma, my mom teach me. And, uh, but um, I already changed and the twist their recipe because here I cannot find 100% same ingredient. Even the, all the vegetable cabbage, even the cabbage, the tasting is really different. So, so, but I really want to represent what is the I memory, the, the, the flavor. So I try to um, different technique, different um, ingredient to mix them. Then I can test. Oh, this I when I grow up I eat this. I eat this. So, so for here I I really appreciate everyone love our food. Really, really, because this is really hard to, because in Taiwanese food, more important is we rely on ingredient flavor to mix the flavor. So we don't add any kind of sauce in, like a, a example, like my dumpling. We don't add any sauce in dumplings. We only use real ingredient. How use the ingredient to mix the flavor is nature and the delicious. So this is quite, really hard to find and to recreate this. And uh, for me, I use a lot Taiwan um, vinegar because that vinegar, when you're testing, you know, mm, it's home, this flavor, this. And uh, so so I really use some Taiwanese sauce then to represent the Taiwanese food the flavor for here. Yeah, but for sure we, we um, share local and use local ingredients. So I want to create the other create, use local ingredient, but use the Taiwanese cooking technique. How I can recreate the new food, but maybe in Taiwan you cannot test this away. But because Taiwan have no this ingredient, Taiwan no have this flavor together. But I use Taiwanese technique so to cre recreate the food for here to share to everyone. So for me, that's Taiwanese food because I'm Taiwanese. I have Taiwanese palate, and I use some Taiwanese sauce to represent 
um, how you how can use the um, fresh ingredient to mix different kind of food together and the for sure need to delicious and I need to like it so, so <laughs> it's very important so, can I add? yeah go ahead oh I just you made me Tony reminded me by talking about the Taiwan cabbage so and I wish the farmer was here they'll be here for dinner later but um but because I used to live in Ecuador before I moved back to the Bay Area, and that's when I started. I really had to make every like there was no skins for to uh, dumplings. I had to you know figure out how to make everything. There were not many Asians living in Quito at that time, anyway. And so that's when I kind of, and I was not working in food. I was working in the furniture and architecture, anyway. And so, um, but that's when I really got into it. And my mom came to visit. And there were a couple of Taiwanese restaurants in Quito, and they were um, really random and obscure, but there were these small Buddhist um, restaurants. And, all of it. and my mom, I just remember, was sitting with, the, she would go sit with the owner, and she would cry <laughs> and talk about the food. And one of the ones that she always talked about was bihun. And she would go, oh, oh my god, oh. And then she started talking about cabbage. And because I grew up here in the States, so I didn't really think about cabbage in this way. And so she was always like, Taiwan cabbage, oh my god, it's so, so light and sweet and crispy. And oh, and I just didn't know what she was talking about. So anyway, so I moved back to the Bay Area, and then I started focusing on these little things. And then Radical Family Farm, and I like to, you know, buy organic or support local farmers and stuff. So they had, I just saw that they were posting about the Taiwan cabbage. Does everyone here know about Taiwan cabbage? It looks like the Western white round cabbage and has the same, same basic, but it's the Taiwan cabbage, and I think it was developed in Taiwan, maybe between Taiwan and Japan, agronomists, anyway, so it could grow in that climate. Um, is it looks the same but it's squat and flat and then when you cut it open it's lighter and airier so there's more space and room and it is really light and sweet and crisp and it chars well and then when i went to taiwan to finally go back a few years ago and learn how to make different things from my aunt and from um, some schools and then they were asking me about how I made my dumplings because I told them I was making dumplings and I go and then I take Napa cabbage and then I do this and they all laughed and they were like Napa cabbage no we don't use that nobody uses that it's too wet Taiwan cabbage Taiwan cabbage and I was like uh, oh my god okay but all the western things that I have access to in reading and greeting it's always Napa cabbage like do this to your Napa cabbage anyway so yeah. Ingredients, the Taiwan cabbage thing remind me of that. And um, oh, one other quick thing I wanted to say about the dessert, because that is one thing, speaking of what is actually Taiwanese. So that dessert that you had, um, had has everyone already had that before? And that, was it a first time for some people? So that, and I forgot, I, should, I have to say it because they sponsored it and they sent it, they FedExed it over. But um, that is the pectin of a fig. And it's a climbing fig that only lives in Taiwan because Taiwan also happens to have, sorry, this is like the Taiwan show, obviously. But anyway, so, but Taiwan is a tiny island with all these people from all over China and everywhere. And, um, but the other thing that we have that's unique is we have really high mountains. It's the highest mountains in East Asia, Jane Mountain. So, but we're really subtropical. So we have a certain climate and certain things only grow in Taiwan. That's why our, we're known for our tea. One day uh, you have to come back because uh, Tony really knows her tea and we'll do some kind of tea thing, I'm sure. Uh, but the other thing that grows in Taiwan really well um, or only is the, these are, it's a kind of fig, and it's a, a vining fig, and it's just these seeds, and it's so easy to make, but it's something that is so Taiwanese. But I think in Malaysia, Singapore, people also get it, but I think it's all from Taiwan, um, these seeds, so. And local honey from, <laughs> anyway, in there, and some local citrus. <laughs> yeah, so that is truly actually one thing it's hard to find outside of Taiwan. Okay, back to I was just checking the time, I realized we're time. 
time flies when I'm having a good conversation. Actually, there's a lot more I love to talk about. I think we'll, we'll have to kind of wrap things up a little bit. But uh, before we go, one thing I want to talk about is kind of extending the idea we talked about today. When people move to a new place, they take their food from their homeland with them. And a lot of times that become their identity. For this Taiwanese village, that became the identity of the Taiwanese food after 1950. And I know for a lot of us, the Taiwanese American or Chinese American food in the United States, that is our identity. And I extend to all of you, regardless where your parents are from, where your family's from, where your ethnicity is, I invite you to share with everyone if there's a dish or a food that remind you of your family, of where you came from, or just part of the U.S., or how your family used to always eat together. So we have a board set up on the back. We have like some pens over there. I invite you to, you can do so anonymously. I invite you to use the opportunity to connect with other folks. Let us know about what is unique for a particular region or a particular ethnicity that you folks experience. Because I do think, and I think all of us at Good Team Dumpling believe that in today's social climate, the more we can connect with each other, the better off we all are. And then one more beautiful way to do that than to do it through food. So uh, I want to thank everyone on the panel today. Thanks for kind of being put on the spot by me and just uh, <laughs> sharing all the wisdom that I've heard you folks had. And um, thanks for coming out. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, I, if you are interested in Taiwanese food, <laughs> sorry, I forgot to mention, this is Yunhai Shop, Y-U-N-H-I-A, Yunhai Shop, and it's these young Taiwanese women in New York, and during the pandemic, they started importing all these small batch Taiwanese ingredients, pantry items. So check them out, and um, they just opened a brick and mortar in Brooklyn, and um, but they and they also really support Taiwan. I think if everyone heard about the pineapple problem um, when China decided not to buy any of Taiwan's pineapples and it sent everyone into a, a tent. Anyway, um, they put it together a Kickstarter and I think raised a hundred thousand dollars to bring all this dried fruit to the states. And so they have all these different programs helping Taiwanese farmers and small batch makers. So look them up also. Sorry. Okay. And, and lastly, uh, I invite you folks. I know the. I don't know if you folks need to get back to the kitchen, but if you have some questions, feel free to come up and talk to any of us. Um, Again, thanks for coming out, everyone, and encourage you to share with us your experience with food that represents your culture. Thank you. Thank you.